Hello, and welcome back to my channel. In this video, I'm going to be covering the evolution of essentially the political spectrum, uh, mostly in Europe, from the time when democracy or re democratic republics, I guess, or constitutional monarchies were invented uh, until present day. So we're going to start with the 1600s. In the 1600s, you had your monarchists, your conservatives, who are usually constitutional monarchists, and your liberals, who are also constitutional monarchists. The big difference between the groups is that the liberals generally were essentially elites who wanted more equality. The conservatives were elites who wanted power at the expense of the king, and the monarchists were elites who believed that they're, like the king was the king, essentially, or queen. Um, then, over time, the liberals essentially moved a lot towards the left, and an entire new uh, political ideology was created, and this is around the late 1700s-ish, uh, it was when it started to form, and you get socialists. Socialists essentially occupied just the bottom left quadrant of the political spectrum, but they were overall very small in terms of this is where the largest amount of voters was essentially this area. So there's not really many voters who would define themselves as the far bottom left of the political spectrum, and there was barely any in the bottom right or top left of the political spectrum. Most of it was still taking place over here. So you still had your liberals and conservatives, but after World War I, socialists began to grow a lot more powerful. And they gained a lot more support, which led to a split between those who considered themselves Marxists and still following their socialist goals, and those who were essentially the reformist wing of the socialist movement, almost a right-wing version of socialism, those who believed that there would be, not only would you keep a democratic republic, but not everyone would have the same amount of wealth, and it was okay if there was people who were a lot richer than others, just those people should then be taxed at higher rates. The liberals uh, stayed where they were, the conservatives stayed where they were, the monarchists stayed where they were. But overall, this was now the political spectrum, somewhere between the conservatives and the social democrats. The Marxists and the monarchists were really at the extremes. Which then led to this. Anarchists became a huge thing in the late 1800s with presidents such as William McKinley being assassinated by them. Uh, major anarchist uprisings in Spain and France. And you also had the Marxist shift from their original, you know, like sort of pro equality and pro economic freedom stance to uh, what I guess closer to what we know as communism today, uh, under essentially under Lenin, which was very authoritarian. Now, he originally didn't envision as much of an authoritarian state as the old order, essentially the monarchists, but he still envisioned it as like a very strict thing. So this was the political spectrum. You still had your conservatives, liberals, and social democrats fighting it out for the majority of voters. Then, however, there was a new thing that came about, the fascists. When the Great Depression hit, it was chaos. The fascists became hugely popular. And, of course, Stalin succeeded Lenin and turned it even more authoritarian. So the communists also became more authoritarian in terms of their ideology in Europe and elsewhere. This meant that, of course, now it's still almost entirely taking place above uh, on the authoritarian side of the scale. Very little uh, action below the, on the libertarian side of the scale. Also, the right wing was still mostly dominating, although there were a few socialist victories in places such as Great Britain, France. Um, but yeah, for the most part, it's still taking place between conservatives and social democrats. Then, of course, we get to the new era. This is immediately uh, during and post-World War II. Monarchism essentially dies out in most countries that still have democracies. Of course, Germany has... Hitler at the time, but Hitler's essentially gone um, uh, in terms of his goal to be a monarchist. He just wants to be the German god, essentially. Uh, so monarchism dies out throughout much of Europe because realistically it had only been holding on in the areas that previously were uh, monarchy, monarchies. Uh, 
you still had your social democrats, your liberals, your conservatives, but you also had a new thing. Uh, you had the populists who were essentially uh, social conservatives who wanted to make everyone more equal monetary wise. Um, and you had your libertarians, which were descendants of the old anarchists. Um, Essentially, they realized you need some sort of government after the chaos of things like the Russian Civil War, but you also need to have liberty in this libertarian vision. Then there was essentially the Great Split. This is when uh, leaders such as Francisco Franco really came to prominence. Uh, Perón could probably, in Argentina, could be somewhere between the populist and militarist axes, I guess. Uh, and there was a bunch of other leaders um in europe and elsewhere who were probably somewhere between the populist and the militarist areas most of the battles for people's minds is still going on between the conservatives liberals and social democrats but now you had two movements you had the greens who originally evolved out of protest movements and started spreading as climate change just became a more widely accepted phenomenon and you also had the democratic socialists which was essentially the reformist wing of communism Democratic socialists still wanted maximum equality, essentially, but they also believed in the that it was necessary for it to be done through democratic means and for free and fair elections, among other things, which was obviously not what Stalin had in mind and his successors. Then there was a further fragmentation, mainly concerning the conservatives and the liberals. In the old system, the conservatives generally had this entire section to themselves. However, the conservatives split, mostly because some conservatives thought that it would be okay to align with the liberals as the bottom left, or just left wing in general, became more and more popular. This was essentially unacceptable to those who considered the liberals as some sort of like idealistic group, and they split off to form national conservative groups. Uh, today, they would be the ECR in the European Parliament. And parties such as the right wing of the conservatives in the UK, Vox uh, in Spain, much of the Republican Party in the United States uh, could probably be considered in the national conservative area today. You also had a split because of the same thing, the liberals. The liberals had been increasingly uh, outside of the traditional political bounds in countries like the United Kingdom, where a two-party system between what was essentially uh, the Labour Party, which considered its base the Social Democrats, Democratic Socialists, and, and the Greens, versus the Conservative Party of the Conservatives, National Conservatives, and some populists. Then this left the Liberal Party in the middle, and the Liberals couldn't decide which side to choose. They needed to either pick were they going to be left wing or were they going to be right wing. And Liberal parties around the world either split in half. Uh, such as in the United Kingdom for a time, there was a split, or they simply chose one or the other. In Germany, the FDP became classical liberal, um, while today I think you could say that the United Kingdom's liberals or the uh, much of the centrist United States liberals could consider themselves firmly on the left wing. You still had your communist, populist, and libertarians, but now there was essentially a right-wing coalition uh, forming between the national conservatives, conservatives and classical liberals, and the left-wing one of the social democrats, democratic socialists, greens. And the other three groupings essentially set out most of this. Which brings us to the chaos of the present day. Present day is essentially a chaotic mess. Um, you had the old order, the liberals and social democrats, they split it. You got groups like the Europe United, we'll call them Volt Europe, but I use Europe United as a placeholder. It could just be any X United, so like in North America, United Party, or South America, United, Asia United, um, stuff like that. Most of the time, your Europe United are essentially going to be liberals who are slightly more economically conservative just because they have a wider area. They're sort of a one issue grouping. Um, you have your new separatist parties. I would consider it like groups like the Scottish Nationalist Party uh, as a left separatist grouping. Um, of course, wanting to break away, but also being very left-wing in their policies. 
uh, much of the Catalonian separatists are like this. Um, you, most of them are going to be left wing. I think you could also put Bloc, the Bloc Quebecois, um, which wants Quebec to be independent from Canada. I think potentially it's a left separatist grouping as well. And of course, you still had your liberals, but you also had your social democrats who originally had been here. But if you go back, the social democrats were much further towards the libertarian end. But because there was now new parties like the Greens, Democratic Socialists, and eventually uh, much of the short-lived pirate parties, um, the social democrats had to move much more uh, towards the authoritarian axis. You still had your Greens, although the Greens were now moderating so that they could be essentially in government because the social democrats didn't want to form governments with Green parties around the world because the Green parties were too left-wing. That's still the case today. Um, if you countries like the United Kingdom. The Greens and the Labour Party don't work together, mostly because the Labour Party considers the Greens as the old age versions of what most Green parties were. Whereas in countries like Germany, where the Green Party is moderated, they gained a lot more support. And the Greens are now the third largest party in Germany. And if an election were held today, it would probably be the second largest. You still had your Democratic Socialist and of course the new pirate parties. The pirate parties were, are very hard to put on the social or economic scale, um, but it's very clear they're somewhere towards the libertarian axis, and they really don't have that many economic positions, so I just have them here. Of course, you had your classical liberals who increasingly are moving further and further towards the libertarian uh, grouping. You have your libertarians, just like in the United States, you still have your communists, although they're realistically one of the only parties who can be in this top left quadrant. The left authoritarian quadrant has essentially died out in modern political philosophy. I think there's still voters, particularly here, who are slightly left economic and much more socially conservative. But for the most part, I do think this section is definitely the weakest right now, probably followed by uh, the right libertarian section. You still had your conservatives. These are probably the Merkels of the world. Um, your more moderate Republicans in the United States, your center right parties. You had your national conservatives who had already been there. You also had your right wing separatists. Right wing separatists are a big thing in countries in Europe, like Belgium um, is probably the best example. Belgium, one of its two regions, is almost entirely dominated by two right wing separatist parties. There's also right wing separatist parties in Catalonia. Um, and you could argue that some sections of the bloc in Quebec are right separatists as well. You have, of course, your populace who shifted much more right wing. The populace used to have to appeal to some sort of what economic base, maybe taking some left wing voters. But nowadays, they're much more about just having, I guess, popular appeal than having policies themselves. Your communists still exist, um, but realistically, the communists most of the time are playing second fiddle to democratic socialists, uh, usually being part of the same party, um, such as in Germany. They're, the party in Germany considers itself democratic socialist, but it also has a large proportion of communists in that party. Then, of course, lastly, you have your illiberal Democrats. And this is a new grouping as well, because it is essentially a new idea of democracy. The idea of democracy since around the 1960s has been a liberal democracy, and that has pretty much taken hold. It's where there's free voting, freedom of the media, etc. And illiberal Democrats are a new phenomenon. I think the best example of an illiberal Democrat uh, it's probably Viktor Orban in Hungary. He defines himself as an illiberal democrat. Um, CPAC, or the Conservative Political Action Conference, uh, which is the Republican in the United States, big uh, conference essentially to go over what their policies are and to showcase all their ideas. Uh, they held in Hungary, and Orban made a speech where he said, if Republicans essentially ended freedom of the media, then Republicans could win. And so I think that solidifies the liberal Democrats as their own different um, group. And I think that in the coming, at least the next decade, there'll still be a lot of liberal Democrats in the United States and much of Eastern Europe. But I don't think that they're going to gain much of a foothold, I guess, 
in areas like Western Europe, where the right wing, far right conversation has already been taken up by your national conservatives and your populists. Thank you for watching, and don't forget to like and subscribe.